Good morning, good morning, and welcome back to Whispering Hope Daily Lesson Study Review here with us. This week, we are studying Christ-shaped lives and spirit-inspired speech. And our topic for this morning, Wednesday morning, is the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. But before we go into our discussion, we're going to invite Pastor Joseph to offer a word of prayer for us. And Elder Josiah will read for us our memory text. Let us pray. Gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we are indeed thankful for the privilege of seeing another day. Uh, you woke us up early this morning and have bestowed upon us the blessings of life and and the joy of being able to interact with others, and we thank you. At this time, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us as we study your word. Grant us your peace and grant us your understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Our memory text is taken from Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 22 to 24. It says... You were taught with regards to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Amen. Now, with that memory text in mind, we're going to begin with Pastor Joseph and then Elder Josiah will come right after. What are some main points or insights that stand out to you from our memory text this week? I like the idea that Paul encourages the believer to reflect on the fact that they have been called from their former life, that they need to put off their former life. They need to walk away from their former life. They, they need to stop practicing the things that they practiced before that were inconsistent with a, a relationship with God and that they should recognize now that they are a new person, a new human being in Christ and that God is working with them so that they can be like him. They can reflect him in terms of his righteousness and his holiness. So uh, for me, the memory text challenges us to be so focused that we move towards a point where we are no longer governed by the rash passions of the past, but we are go governed by the discipline, temperate, encratic discipline that is offered through Jesus Christ. And so that is the call on our lives, and we ought to endeavor to live that out. Amen, amen. I would use an analogy to describe what Paul is saying here. And the analogy is someone just was in prison for a number of years, you know. So you are groomed in this prison type of life. And all of a sudden you were released and you were given a new identity. You were given all the necessary tools to change your mind from that mindset of being in prison. And you were urged to take this new life not to go back to that prison life you know so paul is saying here now that you have this new life take it because it is going to be beneficial for you in the end your past life has no benefit for you and it only leads to uh destruction so that new life that you have in christ now take it and let the holy spirit lead you to what god wants you to be and that is to save your life and to live for him. Amen, amen. So we're going to begin our discussion. We'll ask Pastor Joseph to read for us Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And then when he's done, we're going to come right back and we're going to address our question. Ephesians 4 and verse 30 says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. So with this in mind, we're looking at the question in, this, in discussing sins of speech within the Christian community. What exhortation does Paul share about the presence of the Holy Spirit with believers? We're going to begin with Elder Josiah and then Pastor Joseph will come right after. 
I think Paul is saying here that the Holy Spirit is a person of the Godhead. And just as Jesus came and shed his blood for each and every individual so that we can have eternal life, the Holy Spirit ha has a purpose in our lives today, and that is to keep us in line with, in tune with God at all times. I can say this boldly that without the Spirit, we do not have a Christian life. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us. The Holy Spirit is the one that prompts us to serve God. And without the Holy Spirit, our life as a Christian does not exist. It's, it's plain and simple as that. I, I like what Elder Josiah said. And we ought to pay attention to Paul's counsel here. Because he's calling us not to frustrate the spirit, not to, not to slight the spirit, not to take an attitude that brings the spirit to a point where he no longer is desirous of working with us. I mean, knowing that God is long suffering, that takes a lot for, for that to happen. But, but the point I think is absolutely clear that we ought to guard how we behave. We ought to guard how we speak, we speak about God, speak about others, um, how we treat others how we respond to the pleadings of the Holy Spirit, how we respond to his guidance, how we respond to it, the impression that he makes upon our lives, whether we do not just walk away from it, abandon it, ignore it, you know, belittle it. You know, those are some of the ways that we can grieve the Spirit and, and make it difficult for him to be able to do his work. Elder Josiah pointed out that the Holy Spirit is is integral to our spiritual and Christian experience. Uh, and so if you frustrate him, it is like the tap that brings you the water. If you turn it off, if you cut it off, or as we would say that Antigua, if you don't pay your bill and allow a way to cut it off, you will no longer have access to that water flowing that you need. And so that is what Paul is saying. Don't bring yourself to the point where you make it impossible or difficult for the Holy Spirit to be able to work in you, to work with you, to woo you onto the path that God wants you to be. You know, and Jesus says, it is one sin that, that is beyond forgiveness, and that is the, the ability to shut the Holy Spirit out so that he no longer hears, so that you no longer hears his pleadings, his call, his, his impression upon your life. And so it is the one sin that you... You know, nobody else has control of over, but you do. And you need to be always open, listening, and responsive to the Holy Spirit. And in addition to that also, when you talk about seal unto the day of redemption, remember, it is the Holy Spirit that's that's going to keep us until Christ comes. So the thing is, when we when the Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit, we have to be dependent on the Holy Spirit for our salvation, for our lives to be transformed into that image where Christ wants us to be. So without the Holy Spirit, that's why that's why we, we cannot, we cannot discard of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because it's the Holy Spirit that gives us understanding. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us conviction that Christ is calling for us. So without the Holy Spirit, we cannot move forward knowing to know who God truly is and how God love is truly for us. Amen. So you somewhat went into the second question. However, you could elaborate while you're sharing your thoughts. So the second question says, what is the role of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life? And then you're going to share with us, what are your thoughts? And why Paul is here affirming or confirming the role of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. So we we'll begin with Pastor Joseph and then Elder Josiah. The role of the Holy Spirit, as, as mentioned by, by Jesus, is to guide us into all truth. But the Holy Spirit is also there to awaken in us our, our sense of the covenant that we have with God. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand whether we are in sync with that covenant or whether we have strayed away from the covenant. The, the, the Holy Spirit is there to, to woo us back, to, 
draw us back into the presence of God. The Holy Spirit is there to help us to understand the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is there to, to guide and to impress upon our hearts uh, the need for a deeper, a deeper connection with God. And so everything that we need in order to live that Christian life, in order to walk with God, in order to maintain the covenant relationship with God, is made possible through the, the aid of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so that is why our previous discussion is, is critical, not to bring him to the point where he no longer is being heard or appreciated by us because we cannot be who we ought to be in Christ except the Holy Spirit is there to be with us. And so it is far beyond what we are able to express is the importance and significance of the Spirit of God in our relationship, in our walk, and in our commitment to God. You look throughout the history of mankind, and, and, and we as Christians, we have the Bible to show us how sin originated in, in, in man's life and how it's led to the destruction of mankind. Mankind has always, always had this insatiable uh, appetite or wanting to worship, uh, worship something. And uh, God in his word said, you know what, I never left you. And you know, Jesus, when Jesus was leaving the disciples, he says, I will send you a comforter. And that comforter is the Holy Spirit to always show mankind, however long, wherever you have gone, I'm going to send you the comforter to guide you back to God, to guide you back to uh, a knowledge of what God wants of you. He does that. It's, it, you know, I like the, the all the different examples that Christ brought to us when he was on this earth. Sometimes he gave the disciples parables. And... Uh, Sometimes it's hard for them to understand when he give them the word. And in some cases, it's only after he have left and sent the Holy Spirit to them, they really understood what it's all about. So, yes, the Holy Spirit, when you look at the, the big picture, is just to bring back mankind from the degradation, from the cutoff, when we, you know, we, we, we cut ourselves off of God, the Holy Spirit is what brings us back into a knowledge of God, into a relationship with God, because we ourselves, no matter how much work we do, no matter how much good we think that we do in our, in our flesh, we cannot restore that relationship unless the Holy Spirit is within us to do that. Uh, there's some text that the lesson also shares with us that talks about the, the Holy Spirit's aid in our re relationship. The Romans 8, 16, which says that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In other words, it is a connection between the Holy Spirit and ourselves that bears out the testimony that we are in that covenant relationship with God. Uh, I like Romans 8, verses 20. 26 to 27 as well, that says, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. We do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And, you know, every time I think about this passage, you know, I am very elated because what it says is that sometimes in our weakness and feebleness, we cry out to God. And even though we do so with passion and groaning and crying, yet we fall short of of really expressing the feeling and connecting with God. But the Holy Spirit is there to make sure that that connection is made, that he can approach the throne of God on our behalf in a way that impacts God himself. And so for me, it's a joy, it's a consolation that God takes my feebleness, translates it, magnifies it, 
so that it can have the divine impact it needs to have within the triune. And I, you know, I celebrate that. You know, the other text, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse, verse 10 and 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 13, they all express the presence of the Holy Spirit or the action of the Holy Spirit to help us as believers as we traverse, as we, as we seek to deepen our relationship with God. Amen. 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 So, Many people you hear around, people are asking, when was God created? Who created God? Where did he come from? And how is the son, the son of God? And all those different questions. Now, why should we tread with care in discussing the mysteries of the Godhead? So we'll begin with Elder Josiah and then Pastor Joseph will come right up. You know, many people have their let's let's say discussion about who the God had it. But the thing is when we look at the word, there's no ambiguity about when it comes to who God is because we, we and the Holy Spirit and who Jesus is. Because the Bible tells us in Genesis it says when God was creating this universe it says let us. So let us be it's plural. So we look at and then it says the Spirit of God <laughs> you know, move from the, the, the face of the earth. So we realize that from, from the beginning of our existence, we realize that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit was in unity creating the earth. Now, when, when you know, I, I'm surprised that even some Adventists today is trying to um, take the Holy Spirit out of the picture. You know, there's, I heard some time ago that there's a group of Adventists going around trying to say that there's no Holy Spirit. But the thing is, it's a danger, a very, very dangerous precedence to, to hold on to and to want to give to people. You know, in, in Matthew, Jesus tells us that when we take away certain things, when we take away certain things from his word, we're going to be least in the kingdom of God. If the Holy Spirit was not important to us, Jesus would never, when he was leaving, said he was sent us a comforter and he will lead us into our truth. Like I said in the, in, in the opening, without the Holy Spirit, we would never be living a, a Christian life today. Without the Holy Spirit, we would never have the word before us today. Because it, it, the Bible tells us that holy men that were moved by the Spirit of God put these words together, put the thoughts of the thoughts that God wants us to know in these words. So it's very important that we take these things seriously about who the Holy Spirit really is, who Jesus Christ is, and who God the Father is. Like I said, we cannot say that, and they all they all operate in unity for our for our sake. You know, it's very important, and I, I, I am going to stress this point. It's very important that we yield ourselves so that we can be taught by God through the Holy Spirit, which is the corresponding agent in our lives with heaven continually. This particular section of the, the section of today's lesson entreats us to make sure that we understand fully the Godhead and the role of the persons in the Godhead. And not to minimize their role for us, but also not to distort their role. And I think Elder Josiah made some, made some very salient points there as he discussed this, this section. But it's important for us to be able to appreciate. And I think as, as you led into the question, Adel, you made the point that, that God is, and that the Son, even though he's referred to the Son, that he is God and a, a person distinct from the Father. But also the, the spirit, even though we refer to the third person of the Godhead as a spirit, the Bible is clear in terms of helping us to understand that he has personality. And earlier on in, the, in today's lesson, we talk about him being able to be grieved. And Elder Josiah made the point that we should not miss the fact that he is a person, that he can be grieved, that he understands 
that he works with us. It is important that we do not minimize that and think that, hey, listen, Jesus is somebody that was begotten. And like, people like the term to use a term begotten. Hence, he is not really God, but God had him at some point in time. No, in essence, whenever there was a beginning, Jesus was. So Jesus didn't emanate from anything, wasn't created by anyone, wasn't born to anyone. He was God. At the same time the Father existed, Jesus existed, and so did the Holy Spirit. We ought to be able to appreciate that. But somebody says that familiarity breeds contempt. And so because the Bible pictures the Holy Spirit as being ever-present with us, always walking with us, always working with us, always guiding us, always providing for us, always protecting us, uh, you know, the attempt to be... Uh, the feeling that, hey, listen, maybe he isn't really God. Because we have this picture that God is distant, or as the theologian would say, that God is transcendent. He is away. So anytime you bring God near, then you want him to be a person, you want him to be a human. And that is certainly not the case. We ought to be able to appreciate the fact that God is present with us imminently. And that he acts on our behalf imminently. I was preaching on the whole issue of, of Jacob and his wrestling with God. Jesus himself is there present in the struggle. And Jacob himself made that confession. I have seen the face of God. And so we ought to be able to appreciate that and not minimize the effort that God has made to draw us closer to him. The psalmist, uh, you know, probably expressed the feeling of all of us where in Psalm 80 says, what is man when you consider the extent of the universe, the vastness? Why would God be so concerned with little puny man? And so we think that we are too insignificant for this huge colossal figure to pay attention to us, and yet still he does. As a matter of fact, but he did come and die for us so that we no longer have to suffer the penalty of sin, but that we can be freed. Talking about being sealed for redemption, that was made possible through the cooperation of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So, we're coming on to the end of our discussion, and it has been revealed to us an amazing truth. Now, it is the Holy Spirit, as said by our, our guest in the last question. It is the Holy Spirit who, of God who lives in such intimate contact with us that our actions are said to affect him. We share life with a member of the Godhead committed to us in a durable relationship that seals us until the end of time. What should our faith response be to this amazing truth? So what should be our faith response to this amazing truth? We'll begin with Elder Josiah and then Pastor Joseph will wrap up this question for us. Our faith response is to yield ourselves to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. You know, whenever we, we see that, whenever we see something that we know, uh, because the thing is, the Holy Spirit is going to let us know that God is calling you. And we should, by faith, even sometimes we, we as Christians find ourselves strained in many ways, many different ways. I think Ephesians 4.25, Paul was warning us, we talk about uh, Christians now. Paul is warning us that when we look at our brothers and sisters in church and we say bad things and we do bad things, we are undermining the work of the Holy Spirit. Because here we declare that we are part of the, of the family of God. But yet still we are finding ways and, and I think it's first Peter chapter first Peter chapter five and verse eight it tells us be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walk about seek it whom he may devour now we can only we can only be that way in terms of being sober by yielding ourselves to the Holy Spirit because if we don't do that we would not. We, we wouldn't even smell 
the devil coming. We would we would even imagine that the devil is coming, doing certain things in our lives. So with the Holy Spirit, by accepting the Holy Spirit by faith, by doing the things which God tells us to do by faith, every time the devil comes around, just as when Jesus got baptized and the devil came to him and started to say this, if you do this, if you do that, if you do that, Jesus always will refer to him to the word of God. The word of God. Because he depends on the Father all the time. So he's telling us, in, in a sense, depend on my comforter that I sent to you so that you can withstand the wiles of the devil, so that you do not speak ill of your brother. You do not think evil of your brother. And that can only be achieved by, like I said, accepting the Holy Spirit prompting by faith, by searching God each and every moment of your life. And that can only come by, by the Holy Spirit guiding you each and every time. You being dependent, Paul is warning us, keep the Holy Spirit at the forefront of our minds so that we do not fall into that trap of the devil and lose out of the kingdom of God. A very good submission. Again, you know, <laughs> well, I, I'm reflecting on on this, but what, what should be our, our response to this amazing truth that the that the Holy Spirit gets is affected by by how we behave, um, how we talk, the things that we do. And what comes to my mind, you know, you have a close brother or sister or relative who is always there for you, watching out for you. But every time they come into your presence or you're in their presence, you bring some level of embarrassment by the kind of conversation that you carry on or by the fact that you love to drink or, or you love to talk bad word or or you like to smoke. And, and they just don't like it when you behave that way when they are around. Christians, what we need to do is to change our talk, change our behavior, change our attitude, change our habit so that, you know, we can continue to have the Holy Spirit as our companion, as somebody who's always beside us, who's always listening to us. And the other thing is that the Holy Spirit has our back. He's there to protect us, to guide us into truth, to lead us in the path that's right. And so when we make it difficult for him to do that, that is what it is to frustrate him. And so I would encourage us as, as children of God just to do our endeavor best to change our attitude. And he understands more than anybody else the struggles that we're going through in order to overcome some of the challenges in life. But don't be flippant. Don't disregard his counsel. Don't aggravate him, as I love to say, uh, or don't dismiss his, or don't devalue the contribution that he's making to this relationship. Do what you need to do in order to bring about the change. And the good news is that he is an aid to you in bringing about the change as well. So allow him. Allow it. You know, it is like somebody wanting to help you through a problem, but instead of instead of allowing them to help you, you dig yourself deeper and deeper into the problem, much to the dismay of others. And so I say to us, let us listen to the voice of the Spirit. Let us heed His message to us and let us walk with Him so that we can make it into the kingdom of God. Amen. 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 Now we've come to the end of our discussion. However, we can't end without our takeaways. Now, there was a lot of things that we went through this morning. And there's so many things you could take away. However, you can only choose one. So we'll begin with Ella Josiah and then Pastor Joseph will come right after. What is your takeaway from our lesson this morning? I will go back to the scripture that I read from First Peter. The devil is always, he's relentless in coming after us. And as relentless as he is in coming after us, Christ is also relentless in saving us. So whatever lens God will take, whatever it takes to get us out of the grips of the devil. And the Holy Spirit is his agent in doing that. So let us as we say, by faith, 
hold on to the promptings, to the leading of the Holy Spirit, so that we may not be caught up into the devil's net and lose our salvation in Christ. I take great, great joy and assurance from the fact that the Holy Spirit is constantly with me and with us as we journey towards the kingdom, and that he, he makes himself available to ensure that we grow, we develop, and that when in our weakness we falter and fail and are unable to articulate as well what we really want, that he is dear to be our aid. From that, I said, help me, O oh Lord, not to frustrate him, not to slight him, not to ignore him. And may he constantly be there to provide me with what I need in order to make it to heaven's shore. Amen. Now we come to the end, the completely end of our discussion this morning. And we're glad that you could have joined us. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow when our topic will be kindness, not bitterness. Kindness, not bitterness. So share the link with the family, share the link with the friend, and join us as we continue to study together.